It all started on a bus. Stop by your nearest public library or Hart Transit Center, and that's the bookmark you can pick up for yourself throughout this entire month. It pays tribute to the brave actions of Rosa Parks in Montgomery, Alabama, when she refused to obey a bus driver's order that she give up her seat to make room for a white passenger. Ms. Parks played a critical role in the American Civil Rights Movement as her act of defiance ignited the Montgomery bus boycott. She went on to collaborate and organize with civil rights leaders, including boycott leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and soon became an icon of resistance to racial segregation for most cities in the United States, including Tampa. There was nothing integrated in Tampa at the time as far as uh, grocery stores, there were no clerks, there were no bus drivers, and uh, Tampa Transit Line at the time definitely did not have any drivers. So after we had the sit-in demonstrations, this was in 1960, February 1960. Uh, we went to the field office of the NAACP. I talked with Mr. Robert Saunders, who was the state field secretary. At the time, Tampa Transit Lines were on a strike. The AFL-CIO bus union uh, had a two-week strike. And I told them, why don't we send a letter to Tampa Transit office and tell them that we're going to boycott the buses if they do not employ African-American bus drivers. The mayor in Tampa at the time was Julian Lane, a very liberal mayor. Actually, Tampa was one of the most moderate cities in the South at the time. It was very well received, very well received. Actually, Tampa Transit Lines got back with us within two weeks. Uh, they wrote us a letter back and told us to look for two qualified drivers have them fill out an application and a resume and get them back to them and they would take a shot at, you know, maybe trying to hire some drivers. They did just that and about a month's time they hired two drivers, one of them by the name of Jones and the other one Robert Moore. Robert Moore was already employed with Tampa Transit and he was a mechanic. So he was driving buses around so he certainly knew how to drive a bus. So that's how we got our first two bus drivers. I think what happened when the mayor appointed the first biracial committee uh, during the sit-in times that actually spill over from there and they were able to create harmony as far as race relations and it really helped the city of Tampa. Tampa Transit Lines was a privately owned bus company that dates back as early as the 1940s. In 1971, the city of Tampa took over bus operations until 1979. That's when Hillsborough Area Regional Transit Authority was created by Florida statute. In other cities, they had an audience against that, an ordinance against that. Tampa did not have that. And if you look at the Montgomery story and the Rogers Park, Rosa Park story, what happened there, the city, police department, and everybody was against it. So absolutely, they, they did things that would try and slow it down or stop it, where in Tampa was just the opposite. And when you look back at then and you look now, then you have see where you see African Americans on Heartline Board. And uh, things have changed so dramatically. Uh, you can't believe uh, it looks like a fairy tale. And my own kids can't believe what happened and the things that we had to fight against to receive what we call eco rights. So the stores, uh, there were no uh, job opportunities for, for any African American at the time. So uh, looking back at that time, uh, the sit in demonstration changed all of that. And, and even myself, when I drove for Tampa uh, Transit Lines, I think we even have an African-American dispatcher. So things have really changed, and I applaud Tampa for their stand on moderation. I recently met up with two incredible ladies. They are the third of four generations who have been riding transit in Tampa since the early 20th century, and they tell us their stories. We would walk to that bus stop at Cass in Nebraska. Exactly. If we wanted to go anywhere yeah. beyond because our neighborhood. Because we basically went shopping in Ebor City, and once we rode the bus, we would have to get off here at Castle, Nebraska, and then we would have to walk with our bags, grocers falling out and everything else, to the other side. To the garrison, because we lived in the garrison area. It was a big part of our lives because it provided us transportation from all points beyond our neighborhood, especially for the people who had to go to work. That was a very vital part of them getting to the points where they needed to be, to their workplaces. So yes, the bus played a vital role in what we did and, and how we were able to, you know, 
continue to go on economically. About four generations, we're talking about our grandmother, Mildred Brown, who rode the bus, our mother, Rose Alive, who rode the bus, my sister and myself, who rode the bus, as well as our daughters, Angela Campbell Simmons and Robin Annette Freeman, who also rode the bus. Transit agencies across the country are proud to carry the legacy of Rosa Parks to ensure that all transit riders are treated with dignity and respect and have equal access to transit. Uh, Rosa Parks' story serves as a reminder uh, for government. The government depends on its patrons. Uh, people do not depend on government. Hearts are actually doing very well. Uh, two out of every three Hart employees are minorities. Mm -hmm. And uh, we feel very good about the future at Hart uh, and its employee makeup. No one should ever be prevented from getting to the places that are important to them, like work or medical appointments, or connecting with their family and friends. Thank you for joining us on this very special edition of Your Next Stop with Heart. Back to you, Laura.